no introduction. Mark Hansen is our bishop, the presiding bishop of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, and he is terrific. And so that he might have more time, let me just say two brief things about Bishop Hansen. One, he really loves the Bible. And Mark, you might want to know that in front of you, you have some 300 people who also really love the Bible. Uh, we, it's been a rare privilege to share these two days with them. And the second thing, of course, is personal. Mark and I actually went to seminary together a whole lot of years ago at Union Theological Seminary in New York. And neither one of us would have imagined then where we would be today. <laughs> he, of course, is the presiding bishop, and I have the best job in the church. <laughs> <laughs> Mark has a pretty big week ahead of him, so we are exceedingly grateful that you, Mark, have made time to be with us this morning. So please help me welcome Bishop Mark Hansen. I greet you in the name of our risen Christ. It has been wonderful to just hear the words that have been whispered to me as I entered about what this event has been like. Miraculous, spirit-filled, spirit-led, rare privilege. I expect all of those will be the descriptors I hear next Sunday when people leave <laughs> the church-wide assembly, so that's a good thing. I do want to thank especially Professor Diane Jacobson for her amazing leadership in shepherding this. And also to uh, President Richard Bleese and the people at Luther Seminary, not only for hosting this, but for the strong leadership they're giving in this Book of Faith initiative. Never underestimate what the Holy Spirit can do through one congregation to move a whole church body. It was about 2005. I'm sure you've heard all of this all weekend. No. Well, you wouldn't tell me if you hadn't because I'm going to keep telling it. <laughs> it was uh, Philadelphia Lutheran Church in Dallas, North Carolina. That's an interesting series of names, isn't it? Talk about looking for your identity. <laughs> Or maybe it's a Pauline church on the move or something like that. But Philadelphia Lutheran Church in Dallas, North Carolina said, I think we need to call this church to engage the Word of God. They brought a resolution to the North Carolina Senate Assembly that passed it on to the churchwide assembly that in 2007 embraced this Book of Faith initiative. And it's a very important word, initiative. This is not a program cooked up in Chicago where we don't cook up nearly as much as we're accused of cooking up, by the way. And, uh, and now we're just trying to keep up. Uh, that is really true. Um, w early on when I became presiding bishop, I began to say in my engagement with synods and leaders of this church, I'm afraid we're becoming a biblically illiterate church. But I quickly learned that this is much deeper than about literacy, and it begins much before we learn how to read. And this is about fluency. I know you've heard this. But it's becoming fluent in the first language of faith, which is the language of our scripture, the mother tongue of faith. And so just like whatever your first language is began before you learned to read it, it began when you heard it, when you heard it spoken and sung and prayed and so too our fluency in the first language of faith begins with oral fluency before it becomes oral fluency. And now we have this marvelous initiative in what it means to be a Book of Faith church. I've been particularly moved by the moments of dwelling in the Word. 
I saw David T.D. here early on in this initiative. He brought us to the Colossians text about let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. And he always put the other twist and also let us dwell richly in the word of Christ. And we have been having throughout this church in meetings moments where we stop to dwell in the word. We do it always throughout our church council meetings, inviting each church council member at different times, different meetings, to take two to three minutes to testify. Yes, this is Lutherans testifying. Garrison Keeler the other day, a couple weeks ago, put together a whole show of all the things he's ever said about Lutherans because he's on vacation. Did you hear it? Oh, the Lutheran description of evangelism he had. Well, ours isn't the worst church you'd ever find. Why don't you drop by sometime? <laughs> well, we've got a lot to live down. And, uh, and one of the things is that we don't testify. And we're learning to testify by calling these dwelling in the word moments. And they are very moving testimonies to experiences in people's life that were particular moments when the Word of God dwelt in them richly. I will tell in my opening address Tuesday morning to the churchwide assembly about sitting in the southwestern Minnesota Senate Assembly and a young woman. I get teary thinking about it. We all wept, didn't we, Linda? She talked about her dad dying in an industrial accident and she was on a trip, servant trip and had to come home. And and how that whole journey to her father's dying bedside and the grief that has followed has become for this 17-year-old Janelle a moment of learning to dwell in God's Word. That was a dwelling in the Word, powerful moment. So what is this initiative about, even beyond or embracing this commitment to become fluent in the first language of faith? It is out of the deep conviction that the Word of God needs to engage us, that God has something to say, and that God speaks to us through God's Word, and that when God speaks, there is power in that Word, power to change lives, power to forgive and free and unite and reconcile and send forth into the world. So this is a powerful movement because it is the Word that holds that power Secondly, I think this is also, you wondered what the first point was because you heard about seven, didn't you? <laughs> but it's, it's not just that the Word has power and God has something to say to us, but I think this Book of Faith initiative is about giving us again a meta-narrative that will frame our whole lives. It was Douglas John Hall that said a few years ago, we in the United States and North America, he's Canadian, are increasingly a questing people. We're questing for identity, transcendence, community, and authority. Well, think about those things for which we're questing and think about how the biblical narrative becomes the framing narrative, the meta-narrative in which that questing finds its, play, its satisfaction, its answer. Transcendence, authority, community, mystery. And I think, and I watch this in our young adult children, we have six, they're ages 21 to 33, miraculous, one of them actually invited us all over for supper yesterday and cooked. <laughs> Didn't make dad and mom pay at the restaurant, so miracles never cease. <laughs> but I watch our own young adult children, uh, now young adult, and the lack of a meta-narrative in which one's personal story finds its place. I talk to cab drivers all the time because I find they inevitably have a meta-narrative. They're usually, I ask two questions, where were you born and what brought you to the United States? And those two questions inevitably invite me into their narrative that is first the narrative of struggle and suffering and leaving a place called home coming to this country, but inevitably, nine times out of ten, their narrative also involves their faith being shared as a Muslim, as a Buddhist, as a Christian, as one who is questing for transcendence and a framing narrative. I think this Book of Faith initiative is about that, 
giving us again a meta narrative. Third, I think it's also about reclaiming what we Lutherans mean by the Word of God. We are not the dominant voice in this culture when it comes to our understanding of the Word of God. I don't usually quote the Constitution, and I try not to quote it in church on Sunday morning, but our ELCA Constitution, if you only look at one section, go to the section under Confession of Faith and our understanding of the Word of God. It's a beautifully articulated Lutheran understanding that when we speak of the Word of God, we speak first of the Word incarnate in Jesus the Christ. Secondly, we speak of the Word proclaimed as law and gospel. Third, we speak of it as the Word recorded in the canonical scriptures. Well, you know right away that that puts us in a different context with the dominant cultural understanding of what we mean when we speak of the Word of God. And I think, whatever number I'm on, the, this Book of Faith initiative, therefore, has capacity to not only deepen our understanding of the Word of God, but how we as Lutherans interpret that Word of God. Hermeneutics is not a daily word we use, but I'm trying to use it not just in biblical studies. I'm trying to use it increasingly in the context of mission as well. What's the hermeneutic that frames our mission? How do we move from the text of this narrative of God's story that shapes our life into the context in which God has placed us? And so how do we move from the text of Scripture to the context of our lives? How do we interpret Scripture well, we Lutherans don't agree all on these hermeneutical principles unless you've figured it all out this weekend. But one thing that we do agree on is that we read the Scriptures evangelically. If you've ever heard me in the last eight years, you know I'm on a campaign that we start acting our name. We call ourselves Evangelical Lutheran Church in America and mostly we just go around telling people how we're not like those other evangelicals. Well, get over that and tell people why we do call ourselves evangelical. And one of the reasons is because we read the scriptures evangelically. That is, what shows forth Christ. And we do kind of agree, no, don't quote me on that. We agree that the scriptures are law and gospel. And we agree scripture must interpret scripture. And then beyond that, we get into lots of debate about other hermeneutical principles. But we do agree that the context in which Scripture was written informs our understanding, but we also live in another context into which Scripture speaks. So I believe also the Book of Faith initiative, I think I'm up to about number five, has the possibility that through it, God will renew the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. We Lutherans know something about the power of God's Word to renew and reform churches. Good grief, that's how we were born almost 500 years ago. Martin Luther got slapped upside the head by the Word of God in the book of Romans. Luther said, we are justified by God's grace through faith on account of Christ. Paul thought, I think Luther had it right, so he wrote it to the Romans. And... Uh, <laughs> And that Romans text came back and whapped Luther and off we're gone to be a church body constantly being renewed by the Spirit speaking to us through the Word. It was uh, interesting this morning and down at the hotel. It's so crazy to come back to the town you've lived in most of your life and be in a hotel and feel like you're at home but you are not, can't be at home. And That's a therapy issue somebody can help me with as I leave. Uh, <laughs> But I, my hotel room happened to look out over North Minneapolis where I first served in public housing among the poorest of the poor. Now it's all torn down. It's a variety of houses. But I stood in the window and prayed thanksgiving prayers for the people in that low-income community that had invited me into their lives and together we went into the Word of God. And how I think about in my parish ministry how these moments of dwelling in the Word and studying the Word have become renewal moments for the whole congregation. When Edina Community Lutheran, my second call, decided to embrace search Bible study, I've told this story often, 
parish pastors dying to teach the Bible, get very few people out for Bible study. Finally, we committed to search, but as you recall, search Bible study was lay-led, right? So I stayed home to take care of our kids. The first night we started search Bible study, I own went to start this five-year process of me changing diapers in the congregation studying the Word of God. And 75 people showed up, one-third of our worshiping congregation, to commit to weekly. And that five years literally became a five-year process of renewal. First for the congregation engaging the Word, and secondly for Mark being a better parent. (laughs) But you may have had that in Crossways or Bethel, but I think that's happening through this Book of Faith initiative. And it is finally a chance for us to produce new resources. When, uh, when the kids came to the youth gathering in New Orleans, they all got a Lutheran study Bible with the Jesus Justice Jazz cover. These things are, what, three pounds? <laughs> he ain't heavy, he's my Bible. Um, <laughs> the... Uh, these kids slept these around, and, and we bishops took turns teaching Bible studies. They were options in the learning center, but they could come and spend 50 minutes studying the Bible, studying the Philippians Christ hymn text, which really framed that whole youth gathering, and how fun it was to just take out these Lutheran study Bibles. Um, I, I'm going to tell the story Tuesday about a few months ago when our 33-year-old son who lives in Florida called me and said, Dad... I need a new Bible, and I need one I can understand. Could you send me one? (laughs) Well, when I got up off the floor, not unlike the wedding at Gana in Galilee when the wine was plentiful, I said, sure. I sent him a Lutheran study Bible. About a month later, he called and said, this is just what I was waiting for. This is going to be great. So now if we can complete the trifecta of miracles and find a congregation for him, we'll be great. But... uh, (laughs) But these, when, we sh- when we gave our grandkids the Spark Bible and the Spark Study Bible a couple of weeks ago, it just was a marvelous moment. And look, you know these resources. It's certainly not just about resources, but it is. Now, I still think we have a huge obstacle, and that is getting people to commit to letting the Word engage them. When I'm out in congregations, when I'm with rostered leaders, when I'm with pastors in conferences, there's lots of affirmation for this whole initiative, but what I hear back is, but Bishop, I can't get people to come and gather together around the Word. We know that's a challenge because of our lifestyle, the way that we're framing ministry. Therefore, back to where I started, We need to keep putting the Word into the context where people are and not always expect people to come out of where they are to where we want them to be to study the Word. Hence the dwelling in the Word moments. Hence I increasingly have people talking to each other in the context of my sermons. Hence framing ourselves to adapt something to the context even as the Word will radically alter all of us. So I end with... I did go longer than, see? She said, well, you'll never hold it to 15 minutes, so we're going to start a little early. Uh, (laughs) We're on the road together a lot. So when I think about this week that's coming, and my hope and prayer and confident hope that this will not be a week that the church body some and culture some expect to watch yet another church go at each other and find dissension, disagreement, and ultimately division, but we will find that we are a mature church that can talk about sexuality and acknowledge our differences because beneath our discussions and differences on sexuality, there lies the good news of Jesus Christ that we are sent together to proclaim And through that good news, we find faith in Jesus' name that we will be evangelical Lutherans this week in all we say and do. So, Romans 10. But how are they to call on one in whom they have not believed? How are they to believe in one of whom they have never heard? How are they to hear without someone to proclaim him? How are they to proclaim him unless they're sent? As it is written, 
How beautiful are the feet of those who bring good news. But not all have obeyed the good news, for Isaiah said, Lord, who has believed our message? So faith comes from what is heard, and what is heard comes through the word of Christ. On the floor in my office is a large plaster Paris foot. It was given to me by my staff when I was called to this office to remind me always of Heidi Newmark's sermon at my installation. If you recall, there was quite a bit of fussing then about the historic Episcopate and who was going to lay hands on this new presiding bishop. And Heidi Newmark, urban pastor from South Bronx, looked down at me from that pulpit in Rockefeller Chapel and said, I don't care who lays hands on your head today, Bishop Hansen, but tomorrow I'm going to be watching your feet. <laughs> and where are you going to lead this church as we are all sent together to proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. And she said, Oh, Bishop, may your feet be beautiful. And that's my prayer for you. And this church, as we go into this significant week in our young 20-year history, that the world will watch not so much our rhetoric, but be awed by the beauty of our feet as we bring the good news of Jesus Christ to the world. Thanks for your part in that. Thanks. important conversation partners about the Bible. He never fails to set me straight in the way of the Lord. So please help me welcome Pastor Dr. Rolf Jacobson. Checks in the mail. That was, uh, my wife heard all those things you said about me, which I'll pay for later. 
because the first pastor's wife, that, she, that, that when we got married, the senior pastor that I worked told her her job from now on was to be the number one preacher humbler. So every time somebody says something nice about me, the karma has to come back at me. So, uh, I'd like us to start, I'm just, I've got to get my stuff here. We're going to start um, with another song. Uh, Hans and Larry have agreed to help. Um, it's on the back of your handout. There's a hand, the handout right says the sending, which is the theme for this talk. And then on the back is um, the old hymn, Brethren, We Have Met to Worship. This hymn is, are the original words for uh, a tune that's in the um, ELW, number 461. So if you're one of those people that has to have the music in front of you, you can turn to 461. If not... Um, you're good. So uh, Hans and Larry. And the words on your on the back of your handout are different than the ones in the in, in the ELW. Right. That's the, that's why we're using the handout. Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Well, that song says that we should pray with all our power while we try to preach the Word. Let's do that. And a great prayer to start a Bible study with is just the last verse of Psalm 19. If you didn't know that, you can write that in the front of your Bible. The last verse of Psalm 19 is a good prayer to start with. 
Let's do that. Let the words of my mouth and the meditation of my heart be acceptable to you, O Lord, my rock and redeemer. Amen. I want to thank uh, Hans and Larry. Um, Before I got my Ph.D., I used to be invited to speak to youth gatherings. After I got my Ph.D., I haven't gotten a single invitation to speak to kids. So I don't know what's up with that. Um, They must assume... Yeah, he said, for all the food tricks. I was going to make you drink a milkshake today, Larry, but I decided not to. The, uh, I don't know, they must assume, probably correctly, that anybody who's a professor can't communicate with kids. So I've never been invited back. But back in those days when my brother and I would be invited to speak, I'd always get to work with Larry and Hans. And I've got a story about them later, uh, about the power of, uh, of one of their practices, um, But they are like, Jesus says, the scribe who's trained for the kingdom of God can take, go into the treasure house and bring out what's old and new. And I don't think there's any better description of what they do with their poetry and music and with the treasure of the scripture. So thank them one more time. You guys rock. All right. All right, I need a volunteer of somebody who thinks they, somebody who, if you're low on the end of confidence in terms of your knowledge of the Bible, just put your hand up. All right, you, right there. All right, Wendy, right? Come out here. I just, Larry, hand this to Wendy, will you? It's a, this is a cowbell. It's a cowbell. Anytime I use a word or a concept that you don't know, you ring the bell, Okay? You can sit down. You don't have, you're, you're going to have it the whole time. That's a real cowbell. I, you can sit in your, back in your seat. I mean, it came from a cow in Switzerland. I had to wrestle the cow to get it. <laughs> but, and, if, here, and here's what the rest of you can say. If, there. Uh, don't worry. He says, it's Christopher Walken on, on Saturday Night Live. He says... I've got a fever, and the only prescription is more cowbell. (laughs) Deanna Thompson had video clips. I had to get one in. But listen, if if I use a word you don't know, just then you can yell more cowbell, and Wendy will ring it, okay? Because one of the things that happens, and I'll come back to this, is we use words when we talk about the Bible that people don't know. And we don't even know we're using them. So that's... A real instruction, Wendy. That's not a joke. Uh, I just want to test my assumptions. How many of you are Lutherans? Put your hand up if you're Lutheran. How many of you are um, ordained pastors or associates in ministry? Uh, uh, I mean, not ordained, but how many of you are lay people? How many of you are actively involved in leading a congregational mystery, a ministry? Either. Ha ha. Ha ha. Right here. The Bible says we are stewards of the mysteries of God, so that's more true than you know. How many of you are actively involved in leading a ministry, either if you're ordained that you're right now serving someone, or if you're lay, you're either a professional worker or in charge of the education ministry? All right. I'm going to try to talk to um, all the groups at different points. I've got four points this morning, and in between I've got just a, some few very practical how-tos in case... You haven't gotten uh, any uh, practical how-tos for you to take home. And this is a miracle of the Holy Spirit, by the way, because Mark Hansen just spoke for 20 minutes, and I agreed with everything he said. There there wasn't a single thing he said I didn't disagree with, so I must have, the Spirit has changed me in some way. (laughs) Since Mark and I used to work together back in the St. Paul Synod on the council uh, when I was a dean and he was our local bishop. All right, so the first point I have for you this morning is that you are sent. They asked me to address this. this, the, The theme is the sending. And you are sent today with a blessing. In the Bible, whenever someone is sent, they're sent with a blessing. And I think it's really important to know that there's a difference between permission and blessing. And here's the difference. I don't know where I got this, but I know it was my friend Tom Idstrom who taught it to me. 
Permission is when you say to your wife or your parents, you say, I've been invited to go out um, with some friends on Friday night. Can I go? And permission is when your spouse or your parents say, okay, you can go. Blessing is when your spouse or parents say, go and have a good time, right? And so you are sent out with a blessing from here. Blessing is that you should go and have a good time with the book of faith, all right? If it feels like a duty, another obligation, one more thing to add to your already too long to-do list, then I think it's not the right call for you, and God's got another call for you. You're sent with a blessing. Go and have a good time. We're going to use our Bibles today. If you didn't bring your Bible, it's further proof that you're Lutheran. But there's pew Bibles. The black books in the pews in front of you are pew Bibles underneath. Um, They're great to have here. My favorite thing about the ELW, the new Cranberry Hymnal, is we got to get rid of the green, the maroon, the blue, and one other hymnal. We used to have four hymnals in this chapel. There wasn't room for Bibles. So... We got rid of four, we put in one, and now there's all sorts of Bibles around. I can see all sorts of my friend. Some of you have your Bibles with, and, and one woman said to me yesterday, are we going to ever get to use our Bibles? So I'm really good. Numbers 6, 23 through 27 is where we're going to start today. Number 6, and by the way, you can buy the Lutheran Study Bible today if you don't have a copy, or you can take the black one with you. Right, Rick? We have, a, we have, a, we have a, a, a benefactor of the seminary who believes so much in the Word of God that um, he and his wife give these Bibles and they hope people take them and then they'll give more. So number 6, 23 through 27 is one of the places I go in the Bible when I want to think about what a blessing is. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. And so they, that is the priest, so they shall put the name, excuse me, put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. Turn to your neighbor And just answer one question. What is God doing here? You're just going to have about two minutes. What is God doing here? Go. Thirty seconds. Ten seconds. I am not going to ask you to share back from your groups. 
into the large group, I know that there were tremendous insights out here. I'm not going to, um, sometimes when I ask classes, you know, what do you give? Then the idea is I have to validate your insight. So, you know, I'd say, Tom, what did somebody in your group say? And then Tom said, well, I said this. I go, oh, good, you know, good, right? You know enough and have enough insights. Your insights were good. But I just want to add one more. They shall put my name on the Israelites. There's a phrase in the Old Testament where I cause my name to dwell. I learned this from Diane Jacobson. The temple was the house of God. But the Israelites were a little nervous about the idea of saying God dwelled in the temple. So they said, that's where God's name dwells. So the name is a metaphor for God's very person. Where God's name is present, God is actually there. Jesus says the same thing. Wherever two or three gather in my name, I am right there with them. So isn't it interesting? When we send people out from worship, the last thing we do is bless them. We put the, names Lord on, the Lord's name on them, and you know what? They leave, and God goes with them, because God's name... That's what's happening to you today. Yes, God is here. As uh, Larry and Hans had us sing yesterday, God is here, God is here today, and God is, God's out there too. God's not just here. You bear God as you go. You are bearing God out into your Book of Faith initiative tentacles. God is already there ahead of you, in fact, and God comes with you. You're sent with the blessing, which means you're bearing God. And as I said, I think that means there has to be enthusiasm and passion and fun and excitement in studying the Bible. I have a D-min student. We have a degree at Luther Seminary called the Doctorate of Ministry. Paris pastors come and take, uh, take, sit for this doctorate. And one of my students that I'm working with has a world-famous brother. He's not world-famous, but he's internationally known as a brand expert. He helps companies think through their brand. And I have his brother as my student. The the brother who's the brand expert has helped companies like the Minnesota Wild, Pittsburgh Penguins, because he used to be a professional hockey player, um, all sorts of other companies like Hallmark, and Schwann's um, ice cream. And uh, Pat took a course from David Teedy and Diane Jacobson and Dave Lois and me a year ago about teaching the Bible. And he was visiting with his brother, and I was visiting with the two of them. And his brother said, you know what your problem is with Bible study is your brand is 75-year-old woman. Now, there's nothing wrong with 75-year-old women. My mom is one, okay? Love her. But if that's the extent of your brand, he just he thinks you got to know what your brand is because if you don't know, you're sending messages and you don't know what messages you're sending, right? So you need to be aware of it. You are sent with a blessing. And part of that, I think, is to change the brand to whatever is faithful in your place. My second point is you're sent with permission. In the Bible, when God sends somebody, God sends them with a commission. There's always a purpose to the sending. But I want you to think about permissioning as commissioning, or rather commissioning is permissioning. It's always a commission to do something, and usually that is then permission to do something differently Then it used to be done. So think about it. When God sends out the disciples to make disciples of all nations, that was a commission to do. And we always talk about that as the Great Commission. But then as you look at the rest of the New Testament, it was permission, first of all, to reach with the Word of God a people that had not been reached. The Word of God had just been for the 12 tribes of Israel. You have permission, Jesus says, to go out and reach the nations now, who you didn't have permission to reach before. Before, they had to become Israelite to follow the Lord. To become Israelite, as that story that uh, 
Deanna was talking about yesterday says to become Israelite, you had to become circumcised. That was a brand problem, by the way. <laughs> so, so there would be three types of people that worshipped the Lord. There were those that were called priests, there were those that were called Israel, and then there were those that were called fearers of the Lord, which is ironic. It just meant anybody who wanted to worship the Lord but didn't want to go through circumcision and formally drive the people in. I think fear is a, that was a good, good label, right? <laughs> so, permission. And Paul had to convince the people that the permission Jesus had given them that all foods are clean, that was real. Because a lot of people said, no, no, we don't have permission to change the way things have always been done. Think about Ezekiel. Ezekiel, when he was called... He, he did, I mean, he was commissioned and given permission to get God's word across in ways that were unorthodox. If you don't know much about Ezekiel, thank you. <laughs> Ezekiel was a priest found during the exi- called during the exile. You might not know what the exile is. I'll come back to that. How many of you have seen at your local grocery store Ezekiel 4-9 bread? You can buy it. Turn to Ezekiel 4, just for, just for fun. I learned something about this past re- passage recently that busted me up. I, was, I, I thought it was so funny. So notice, this is Ezekiel 4, 9. And in your Lutheran study Bible, right before chapter 4, it says, the siege of Jerusalem is portrayed. That's actually in the NRSB. That's not unique to the Lutheran study Bible. So this is... The, Chapter 4, this is the start of Ezekiel's ministry. He is in exile over in Babylon, and he's preaching to the people who are still back in Jerusalem because the city hasn't fallen yet. And he says, God says in verse 9, And you take wheat and barley, beans and lentil, millet and spelt, put them into one vessel and make bread for yourself. And so, of course, what do literalist biblical people do in the 20th century? Oh, that must be a recipe for what God wants us to eat. And so they make a loaf of bread and they sell it. Do you eat that, Deanna? No. I thought you might because Deanna's a vegetarian. And uh, a lot of vegetarians eat this bread. I heard Cheryl Teagues talking about it on the radio, so I know it's true. (laughs) Here's what I never knew about it, though. Here's what I didn't know until this week. That's unclean bread to mix these ingredients together into bread was against God's law so just think about what God's saying to Ezekiel you have a commission to get a message across to the people and to get it across I want you to break the law right now that's some good permission and if you really want to see some good permission think about Hosea who to get God's word across married what the NRSV calls a wife of whoredom. Married a prostitute. Although I can't get into all the details with that story today. You have permission from God. It's all over the Bible. It's not from me. You have permission from God. When you go now, when you're sent, you have permission to change how you do things. David Anderson talked yesterday about new models are necessary. In fact, I, the urgency of the necessity for new models, I can't possibly turn the volume up loud enough on that. I don't think, I mean, you have to have new models. Here's, here's what I don't want you to hear. You've got to work harder at doing this. You've got to be better at doing what you've already been doing and that has been failing for 30 years. Because, you know, working harder at a model that isn't working well enough is burnout. I was on my internship in Mount Vernon, Washington uh, 20 years ago. Uh, next week I left. 20 years ago, and one of the other internship supervisors, not my internship supervisor, but one of the other ones, Uh, had relocated out to Washington from southern Minnesota where he'd burned out in that call. He said, I knew I burned out when I was making a pastoral call on a person 
And I knocked on the door, and they opened. They said, what are you doing here? It is 11 at night. He said, I realized I was burned out. He was working harder and harder at the old model. And that's what we all do. When something's not working as well as we want, attendance goes down a little bit, budget goes down a little bit, well, what we've got has been working just well enough, right? It didn't go way down, the attendance and the budget. It's just going down a little bit. That's what's ha- been happening to the ELCA for 21 years. Actually, it's been happening to the congregations that made up the ELCA back before they were the ELCA for 45 years. We ne- You've you got to invent those new models. I can't tell you what they are. But do you remember the story of John Henry? John Henry, uh, the legendary African-American uh, railroad worker who could drive the, uh, drive the um, what's the word I'm looking for? Spikes. He could drive the spikes faster. And so he got, when they got a steam engine, which was a new model, when they got a steam engine to come in, he raced the steam engine. And here, this is from the song. One of, this is from the old folk song. John Henry was hammering on the right side, the big steam drill on the left. Before that steam drill could beat him down, he hammered his fool self to death. He did. He won. He beat the steam drill, and then he died. Hammer in his hand. Pastors, professional lay workers, we are not telling you at this conference to work harder. Don't kill yourselves. All right? Don't do it. You've got to find new models, and you have permission to do that. I want to tell you a story about somebody that I think has a model that works pretty well. Listen carefully, because in a minute you're going to discuss what you hear. This is my wife's sister, Carrie, and her husband, Eric. They are Missouri Synod, faithful Missouri Synod Lutherans, and they start Bible studies wherever they are. And... Carrie, is, she's not bragged, but over the years she said, yeah, you know, we had to split our Bible study up again. Why? Well, it got too big. And so I've heard this story for a few years, and finally, I'm slow, but I'm not immovable. <laughs> I finally said, tell me what you're doing. And she says, well, here's what we do. We get a, this is what I want you to listen to. We get a babysitter, and the babysitter's at church, and everybody drops their kids off. Then we come to our house, we have a meal, we drink beer. This is Missouri Synod, right? Okay? We drink beer, and then we have an hour Bible study. And they covenant for six weeks at a time. So six, six sessions at a time. I think they meet once a month, but they covenant for six sessions. And she said, we just finished one. We just finished one on how to be better spouses. I said, do the pastors come? Yes, two pastors come because they like Bible study and they like beer, but they talk too much. All right, you take two minutes and you unpack that model. Go.
All right, 30 seconds. Five seconds. All right. Again, I know your insights are good. I'm not correcting them or telling them what you should have heard. I'm adding to them, okay? Here's what I've heard, and I've, I shared this with a group of pastors last week on an annual study trip that we have together, and they helped me see this. First thing, hospitality. That's the key. How do we normally choose our Bible study leaders? We normally choose them if they know a lot. Like me. I know stuff that bores me. I I mean, seriously. I know stuff that not only would it bore you if I told you, but when I start to give the answers in class, I'm out the door mentally, and my mouth is moving. I'm not kidding. What if we chose, if the radical challenge is to create a culture of Bible study in our congregations, Augsburg Fortress research shows that in ELCA congregations, between 6 and 9% of adults are in Bible study. 6%! And if you're a really good congregation, 9%. There is massive room for improvement, yes! What would it be like if your congregation said, we're going to try to get that to 25%? That would be a really high goal. I think you can do it. Here's, this is a suggestion. Pick your Bible study leaders based on whether they have the spiritual gift of hospitality rather than the spiritual gift of being a Bible nerd. Let me show you the people Just do a Google image search in your head right now. Put in hospitality person, run it through Google, click images. In your life, who do you see right now? I'll show you who I see in my life. The first person is, I know her, it's Diane Jacobson. (laughs) Diane Jacobson, you know it's true, Diane. She knows it about herself. She has the gift of hospitality. You can ride in an elevator with her and you can feel at home. (laughs) It's true. She... You can be stuck in it, but she has a way of turning a cold space warm. It's true. (laughs) The person on the left is my friend Kristen Weersma. She uh, she and her husband Hans, this is her her brother, but um, this is the best picture I could find of her on the Internet. She has the gift of hospitality, right? She collects friends like some people collect CDs, right? She collects friends like some people used to collect baseball cards. She has the gift of hospitality. Let's cover up her brother. That's my sister-in-law, Carrie, last week with Dirks Bentley up at WeFest. Dirks Bentley is a famous country singer. I can tell what I'm working with now. You guys knew who he was, yeah. (laughs) Carrie, by the way, (laughs) Ella... That's good. Carrie... By the way, she, K- Carrie works for LSS North Dakota, and she runs the VIP hospitality tent at WeFest as a fundraiser for LSS. See, they're smart. They got, who do we know that's got the gift of hospitality to run the VIP and sell drinks and raise money for the poor in North Dakota? Carrie. Now, I got to say, I think more women in my life have the gift of hospitality But not all. I know men. I just couldn't find pictures of them, of my friends today. (laughs) The image I have of hospitality, I don't know what yours is, is the image of a well-set table. Something that makes you want to come in and sit down. My teacher, Kenda Dean, said, my teacher, Kenda Dean, said about hospitality, She was teaching us how to teach, and she said, the room starts to teach before you open your mouth. So think about where you do your Bible studies, and what's that room saying? Now, look around here. Think about how this, worship planners know this, worship space builders know this, 
And so when you came in this morning, Hans and Larry had music going probably, right? And there's art, and there's a, there's a symbol up there focusing your attention and so forth. There's art on the walls. Air, we, we worship here in air-conditioned comfort on cushioned pews, right? Hospitality is the first key. Second of all, what I hear in that model of what Carrie and Eric do with Bible study, by the way, that was what Bishop Hansen was saying earlier, right? Search Bible study. His wife, I own, led it. 75 people show up. He stayed home and was with the kids. Second of all, I think there's a different role for pastors here. Now, there is a role for the professional expert. I'm not against experts, as I like to say, I is one. That's just not in grammar. But usually in Bible study, we've used our authority as the expert like this, okay? Our, we've used our expertise like this. And we've said, there's the Bible. I'm going to tell you what it means. I'm going to declare to you its meaning. I will explain. Now, that's a pretty good model for a different culture. It's a very good model if the people's questions are, I know the Bible already, but I really want to know what it means. And there are good... You know why that's a good model? Because 6 to 9% of the people come for it. <laughs> and for that 6... I, that wasn't sarcastic. For that 6 to 9%, it's a good model. But another 6 to 9% need a different model. So what would it be... Come here, Larry. What would it be if the model was this instead? All right, I'm going to recruit Larry to lead the Bible study and... I say, here, Larry, what are your questions? How do I, how do I, right. There's a famous story about that, by the way. You can sit down. (laughs) Famous story of a famous Bible study, a Bible expert named David Noel Friedman, who they discovered a piece of ancient writing, and he was photographed, and it went off to all the newspapers, and he was photographed holding it upside down. (laughs) Which is why my teacher, Pat Miller, wouldn't even pick it up when they tried to hand it to him because he didn't know which way was up. (laughs) I think the role for the pastor then is as the one who recruits and encourages and equips and as the one who gives permission. So you are not only sent with permission to do something different, permission like love is more powerful when you in turn give it away. Permission like love is more powerful when you give it away. Permission is not just something you have, but you give it to other people and say, you read the Bible now. I give you permission to read the Bible. And what help do you need? I think there's a different role here for the church's education budget. I don't know what your education budget is. $750, $900. Maybe you're at a big church and you have $1,300. And your... And your model is, if you're in the Twin Cities, your model is email Rolf Jacobson, Diane Jacobson, David Anderson. Would you come and do three weeks for me on the book of Psalms? I can do a week on the sad Psalms. I can do a week on the glad Psalms. And I'll do a week on the mad Psalms. Does that sound good? I got an email this week. I got two emails this week asking me to come do that. Take your church education budget and hire babysitters. At church... And you say, you're a couple, we're going to hire the babysitters for you. Recruit the five people in your congregation who have the best gift of hospitality. We're going to pay for the babysitters. You invite people. We'll even let you invite people that aren't members of the congregation. What? We can use a... That's not right. That money's for us. (laughs) Right? That's... Yeah. Wouldn't that be evangelism? We're going to hire the babysitter so you can invite your friends to your house. We'll even pay for the beer, and you talk about God with your neighbors. Yeah, you have permission to do that. That's what I hear going on. And I also hear in the story, I also hear in Carrie and Eric's story, start with the people's questions. What are your questions? Right? We always start with the pastor's questions. We're going to do the Ten Commandments. Why? Because those were Martin Luther's questions. Those are my questions. We're going to start with the creed. Those were Martin Luther's questions. Those are my questions. It's what I'm interested in. Instead, get a person with hospitality. Hire the babysitters for them. 
buy them dinner if you can afford it. If not, they'll make it themselves. They're going to be happy to see their friends and say, what are your questions? My question is, I don't know how to be a good friend. They'll say, no, I'm not saying that's my question. Okay. There, maybe, and then you, as the pastor, say, okay, I'm going to give you eight passages that I think, or six, because you're going to do this for six weeks. I'll point you to six passages which I think shed light on friendship. I'm not going to tell you what they say, but still, that's a different role for the expert, right? Okay, next point. I'm still under you have permission. You have permission to be different in worship. Last week when we were doing this, talking about how to have a better Bible study life in a community, one of the pastors said, are you giving me permission not to use the lectionary on Sunday morning? He said this. This was my seminary roommate. He said, are you giving me permission not to use the lectionary? I said, you didn't ever need it. I read the Bible once. It's nowhere in there does it say you have to use the lectionary. I read the book of Concord once. It doesn't say you have to use the lectionary. Now, just I want you to think. Imagine yourself as someone who doesn't know anything about the Bible, doesn't know where Ezekiel is, doesn't know what the exile was. Let me give you a quick timeline of the Bible. Starts, we're going to start here and move this way, okay? Just in Israel's life. God calls Abraham and Sarah, right? Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, the time in Egypt, Moses, the time in the wilderness, coming into the promised land with Joshua, the judges, the kings, David and more kings, then the exile, the kingdoms are done, they're sent out, then they come back and the people become a people of law and a people of priests. Jesus is born, Jesus lives, he's crucified, he's risen, and then the age of the apostles. Okay, that's the timeline. Now, the texts for today, if you were out in a a church, I looked them up. Just think, you don't know the Bible. The first first reading is from Joshua 24, entering into the promised land, right? The psalm is Psalm 34, which I believe is a pretty late psalm, probably after the exile. You think so, Diane? Next reading, Ephesians from the apostolic age. Then from John. Now we're going back. We read them and we don't tell people when they're from. We expect them to be able to contextualize them. They don't know the story. Next week, first reading from Deuteronomy. That's Moses. That's before Joshua. If they were there last week and are coming back this week, they're still trying. Now we got Mo. Who's Moses? When did he live? Second reading, Psalm 15, which is an early psalm before the exile. Then James, apostolic era, but different book than last week, right? I say James and you start to laugh. Because you're so Lutheran, you know it's funny. But the people, right? But you know what? That's right. That's exactly right. Because you know James says, faith without works are dead, and Luther said, Compared to the other parts of the Bible, James doesn't carry Christ very well. It's a letter of straw compared to like Romans, James, Luther said. And then the next reading is back to Mark, back to the life of Jesus. So think about this. Two weeks, readings from seven different books of the Bible. No context. I just want you to think about it. I'm not telling you what to do about it. I think we have to change the way we preach on it. Mark was talking about that. Mark, uh, Bishop Hansen said, I have people talk to each other during my sermons now. Maybe in your sermons, instead of explaining what a text means, declaring its meaning for 12 minutes, maybe you're going to preach on the book of Matthew straight through. You're going to do it for four, you're going to do it for eight, four months maybe. Maybe the book of, after that, we're going to go to the book of Ephesians. I don't know. And instead of just saying what it means and trying to apply it to life, I'm all for that. It's what I grew up with. But maybe it becomes a way of inviting people to hear their story in light of God's story, which is where I'm going next. You are sent to find yourself in the Bible. 
I'm going to go right. I might come back to that. That's my third point. But it's almost identical to my last point, which is more important, which you are sent to find God's story in your story. And this, again, this is what uh, Eugene Peterson was saying. It's what Mark Hansen was saying this morning. Gene Peterson used this phrase uh, two days ago. He said he came back from this conference and the God had been shriven from him, right? By whatever happened. And he read Karl Barth. Every page was about God and read himself back into a God-saturated world. He said, we don't live in a God-saturated world. I want you to read the Bible in such a way that you help people live into a God-saturated world. So... If you preach in such a way that they're, you're telling stories about people's life in light of the Bible, you will help them imagine their lives as part of God's story instead of just applying the Bible to them and saying, you, know, you should love your neighbor. Well, they already know that. The reason I picked Brethren We Have Met to Worship today is that song is what this God-saturated world looks like. Turn to that hymn, would you? What I want you to do is I want you to notice. I want you to notice the role of the Bible here. Who are we in this song? We are sisters. Moses had a sister. So when we think about sisters, we think about Moses' sister and what did she do? Will you help the trembling mourners? Who are the people gathered here? Well, they're like the mourners who are mourning. Which mourners in the Bible? Well, maybe they're the ones who mourn Jesus' death. Maybe they're the ones who mourn the fall of Jerusalem when Jerusalem was destroyed. You know, there's, you could start to imagine who are all the mourners in the Bible. I especially like the third stanza here. Is there here a trembling jailer seeking grace filled with tears, the jailer who, when Paul and Silas are miraculously freed from jail in the book of Acts, he thinks he's going to be killed because the prisoners escape and Paul and Silas then don't, right? Because they don't want him to be killed. To live in a world and to preach in such a way that those stories become part of their story. When were you a trembling jailer? When were you the person that left somebody else as the trembling jailer. You're over at your friend's house. You do something wrong with your friend. They, you know, you break your friend's mom's favorite uh, glass pitcher. You left. You went home. Your friend stayed there to take the blame. You turned your friend into that trembling jailer. Right? That sort of... You're living now in a God-saturated world. Is there here a weeping Mary pouring forth a flood of tears? And, of course, the metaphor for the whole song, that when we read the Bible, God is feeding us with holy manna. You know the story. Manna in the wilderness. The Israelites come out of, Is- the Israelites come out of Egypt. They're starving. God feeds them miraculously with manna, a flaky white bread. The name manna literally means what is it? Mana. Right? My kids say that very often at dinner. What is that? As Gunner says, well, that's fish. That's yuck, he says. Have you tried it? No. All right? I want you to take a minute and talk to your neighbor. With what manna have you been fed the last three days? Go. With what manna have you been fed the last three days?
10 seconds. Stop. All right. The, the, method, the method of biblical interpretation that I just invited you into is a method that my beloved, maybe my favorite teacher, Don Jewell, taught me to hate and have utter intellectual contempt for. It's called allegory. That when you read a text, you ask a question like, well, what's the manna in our lives? You hear the Easter story, what's the rock that in your life that God needs to roll away? Or you ask, you know, um, what's, the blind man was healed. Well, what's our blindness? My teacher, Don Joel, and I loved him so much. He taught me to have intellectual contempt for that model for pretty good reasons. One reason is it, there's no control, Right? And you, can, and you can trivialize it. Well, the rock in my life is, I, I, I got a hangnail, it's really bothering me, right? You, can, right? you can trivialize really big stuff, and there's no control. The rock in my life is, you know, my 401k account is now, what, a 201k, right? That's their joke, right? <laughs> That's, um, but here's what's good about it, and this is something that Rick Fleece is uh, I've watched him do this. They, it helps people make sense of their life in terms of the biblical story. Is there all sorts of intellectual stuff wrong with it? Yes, and go do it anyway. Because people get quick payback. People will not come to your Bible studies if they're not gonna, if they're not getting quick feedback. I mean, you know, quick rewards. We live in this instantaneous society, and I, this is not pandering to them. I really don't think so. It's helping them get early wins. Because when you're going through change, you fear loss, say Heifetz and Linsky and Leadership on the Line, and the way to stop people the way to get people to continue engage in change while they're fearing the loss, because in change, the loss comes first and then the new gain. That's much later. You have to give them a vision that there will be a better. And that vision, they need to get something out of the Bible study. A lot of our Bible studies, I didn't get much out of that, Pastor. We'll come back again for six more weeks, and I think after six or seven weeks, six to nine percent, that works for, Right? For other people, they need, they've been to Bible studies and it was boring. They've been to Bible studies and it was irrelevant. They've been to Bible studies and they felt ashamed. They were embarrassed because they didn't know enough. You don't need to know a lot to say, how is God like a light? How has God been like a light, Psalm 27, in your life? Right? Immediate connections. That helps people to start to... There might be all sorts of intellectual things wrong with it, but it helps people start to live in Gene Peterson's God-saturated world. I wrote a series of Bible studies, and I'm not shilling them, with my friend Kelly Fryer. And Kelly Fryer developed this method. Of every text, ask these three questions. What do you think God is doing here? I, that's what I had you do with numbers, right? What do you hear God saying to you personally, and what do you hear God saying to us? There's nothing magic about these three questions except one thing. And you know what that is? They're about God. They're not about, what was the psalmist experiencing here? What original Zitzim Laban got the psalm to write this psalm? Wendy? Yeah. Somebody's yelling cowbell. Right? That is, what life setting gave birth to this psalm? Who cares? I mean, really? I don't even care, and I write books about it. <laughs> the Bible should, if we're teaching it right, help people live in a God-saturated world. So this is what I want to end with. I want to end with Deuteronomy 5. Turn to Deuteronomy 5. Some of you have heard me tell, use this uh, passage before, and if so... I'm not as bad as Tony Campolo with the story about Sunday's coming, but I'm getting there. 
I, have to, I almost use this text every time because to me it's the most important text in the Bible about the Bible. Deuteronomy 5. Moses has led the people out of Israel. He's led them for 40 years in the wilderness. He's, God said, you're going to die. You don't get to go into the Holy Land, but you get to give a long goodbye speech. And so we have the book of Deuteronomy. So Moses convened all Israel and said to them, look at verse 2, The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Horeb is another name from Mount Sinai where the Ten Commandments were given and the formal relationship between God and the people was consummated. The Lord our God made a covenant with us at Horeb. Not with our ancestors did the Lord make this covenant. Literally the word ancestors is fathers. But with us, who are all of us here alive today? On the surface, I just want you to realize that what Moses is saying to the people is on a literal level, 100% false. None of the people that were with Moses that day, aside from himself, Joshua, and Caleb, none of them had been present at Mount Sinai. It was their fathers and mothers. Translated here as ancestors, it should have been parents. A better translation, that is, not with your parents did I enter into a relationship, did God enter a relationship, but with us, who are all of us here alive today. The Hebrew here is really, really strong. It's literally, but with us, we These ones here, today, the living. Now, on a literal level, it's not true. Those people were not at Horeb. They weren't there. Moses is saying this. Moses is saying all the stuff in the Bible is not about Abraham and Sarah, Isaac and Rebecca, or Peter, Paul, and Mary. Okay? Okay? The stuff in the Bible is about us. It is our story. If you're reading it for historical information about what God did for David or God did for Martha, you're reading it wrong, Moses is saying. It's about us. If you want to know who you are, you've got to know the biblical story. You are a weeping jailer. You are Moses' sister. You are Peter. So you should preach and teach and read the Bible in such a way that when you betray a friend, you can hear the cock crowing in your head. You should read the Bible and help other people live their lives so that when the church you're part of betrays one of its central principles for a mild cultural gain, that you can taste the stew that Esau ate and traded his blessing away for. Do you remember the story where Esau... Thank you. Esau... I'm going to go a couple minutes late. <laughs> Jacob and Esau are brothers. The older brother gets, is supposed to get the blessing. Oh, my little brother points out that in the, the younger brother always gets it. My brother has pointed that out to me quite rude of him, I think. (laughs) Esau is given the blessing, but Jacob wants it. So Esau is hungry one day, and Jacob's eating because he's made a stew, and there's only one bowl, and Esau says, give me some of that. And he says, you got to give me your, you got to, you're going to have to give me your birthright first. Okay. When our church betrays one of its fundamental convictions, I don't have any opinion about what that might be, but when we do, you can taste the stew. That's how you should live in the biblical narrative. When Mark was saying about the Bible's a meta-narrative, right? that's what Mark meant. He means that you're reading a story about Samuel and it's about you. It's not about somebody else. And here's how it works. And uh, I, um, 
A few years ago, my dad turned 75, and uh, we had a dinner party for him for his 75th birthday party. We ate at the Cherokee Steakhouse over on Cherokee Avenue in West St. Paul. We ate there because on your birthday you get a free steak. Even though we were buying dad a free steak for his dinner, he wanted to eat at the place where he got one free on his birthday because that's my dad. You got a dad like that or did you have one once? Maybe, all right. Now notice how in, I just told a story, you know a little something about my family now, right? Well, we're sitting at the dinner table and my daughter who had just turned five, my daughter says, Grandpa, what was your life like when you were five? Where'd you live? I said, we lived on the farm. We lived at the farm south, southeast of Montevideo near the little town of Wigdal. You lived on a farm. What was that like? Well, one day I climbed up the windmill. The windmill turned around in the wind and it provided mechanical energy to draw water up from the well. That's what a windmill is. We don't have those anymore. I climbed up there and I got stuck. I couldn't get down. There was a platform on top. He climbed up over the platform. He couldn't, at the age of five, swing his legs over to get back down. So he was crying for help. On the farm with uh, dad, where his dad uh, lived, Grandpa Rudy, but also dad's Uncle John. Grandpa Rudy was fearless of heights. In his 80s, he was still painting the big light standards at the football field of Montevideo. He'd go up with a bucket and a brush and just paint, go out. He was fearless of heights. Uncle John, who was his painting business partner, terrified of heights. Dad's yelling up there, and Grandpa had gone to town, and only Uncle John was there. So terrified of heights... He went up and got Dad down. Then Ingrid did something that was really smart. She said to the next person, tell me a story when you were five. And then we went down the table, and everybody was told, told a story about what they were when they were five. Now, Ingrid wasn't learning about who Grandpa was with that story. She was learning who she was. That is, she's a Jacobson, and that story meant that when you're a Jacobson, if you climb up somewhere that you can't get down, what's the windmill in your life? Someone's going to come and get you, even if they're afraid of heights. That's how we learn who we are. If we're not preaching the biblical story, we aren't telling people who they are. And the fact that our church doesn't know the Bible means they don't know who they are, and they don't know who God is in their life. And so that is what you're sent out to do. Go in peace. Serve the Lord.